As I said, today we are talking about faith alone. Uh, it's the second in our series of the five solas, or the five alones, of Protestant Christianity. Of the five, this is the easiest one to research in terms of reading Swedenborg's work, because this is a phrase he uses many times. When I put it into my search engine, it came up with 300 different um, paragraphs where he uses this phrase, this exact phrase, faith alone. So from that point of view, it's very easy. However, I have to say the verdict is not a good one in Swedenborg's book. And I'm going to give you some examples. So this is entirely from The Last Judgment, little book that he wrote, The Last Judgment, from paragraph 39, where he sums up what he says about um, the idea of faith alone. And there are a number of other statements he makes in this paragraph. I've cherry-picked them for you. So he says this, Love or charity makes the church, and not faith alone. Faith separated from charity is no faith. Doctrinals concerning faith alone destroy charity. They who make faith alone saving excuse a life of evil, and they who are in a life of evil have no faith because they have no charity. So you can see Swedenborg's um, verdict on faith alone is not good. That's certainly not the way that he uses it. However, it's worth holding on to something here. We've been talking recently about paradox. And one of the things that Swedenborg says about the idea of heresy is heresy is a religious idea which is based on a half-truth. It's based on one side of the equation and ignores the other. So when we talk about the idea of faith alone, we have to understand that in Swedenborg's eyes, it's not that it's a complete falsity, but it is a half-truth. So it's worth our asking, what is the truth in it? And at what point does, do we push it too far? So here's my understanding, summarised. When we had our little membership group last week, I talked, used the sentence, God is, that we can all complete with love. God is love. Now, we are made in the image and likeness of God. Therefore, we are ourselves a form of love. The problem with that is the human heart is corrupted. We are not typically the kind of love that God is, which is eternal love, love for all of creation, love for all of humanity. We are very much wrapped up in our own selves. And so the love that tends to dominate us is the love of self and love of worldly things, love of external things. It might be power or wealth or whatever. That's the kind of love that we tend to be. Now, if we are only that love, there is no hope for us. I have met people, and I'm sure you have met people also, who live a life which is entirely selfish. And as I've witnessed it, these people tend to live also a miserable existence, life which is focused solely on oneself and solely on gathering together great wealth or power or whatever it is or fame is a miserable existence. Some people will think it's the most wonderful thing ever, but if you observe it, you see what is actually going on in their lives. It is miserable. So as I say, if all we are is love of self and love of the world, there is no hope for us. The only way to move on from that is actually to recognise the nature of the life that we lead, and that requires insight. That requires us being able to look at the nature of our own lives and understand it for what it truly is. And two things are required to enable that to happen. Now Swedenborg talks about the way the human mind is divided. It is not only a will, it is not only about love, it is also an understanding. And the understanding part of our mind can be developed independent of the will, 
so that it is able then to look back at the will and make judgments about it and understand what it is about, what is going on. Self-reflection is a function of this idea of the separation between the will and the understanding. Unless the understanding could be separately perfected and the will by means of it, a man would not be a man but a beast. For without that separation and without the ascent of the understanding above the will, he would not be able to think and from thought to speak, but only to express his affection by sounds. Neither would he be able to act from reason, but only from instinct. So if we were just a will, we would just act in an automatic way. There would be no choice, no change. We would be the way we are and we would stay that way. The understanding allows us to do something a little differently. So we need that separate understanding from the will. But the second thing we need is an independent source of truth, a source of truth outside of ourselves, outside of the human mind. And that is the word, the word of God. It is a standard against which we measure ourselves. There's a lovely passage in John's Gospel, which I very much enjoy. And I enjoy particularly, unusually for me, the Good News translation of it. This is how the judgment works. The light has come into the world, but people love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds are evil. Those who do evil things hate the light and will not come to the light because they do not want their evil deeds to be shown up. But those who do what is true come to the light in order that the light may show that what they did was in obedience to God. So there's that second requirement for us to be able to grow, to become anything different than that love of self. This is the only way that we can be reformed, reborn, saved, through faith, alone. It's the only way to say without that, we remain the beasts that we might otherwise be. Having said that, we can't stay there. There must be something beyond this. Here's a well quoted sentence. The just shall live by faith. It's not that we just accept faith intellectually, it's that we live by it. And that's a fundamental um, truth that we must grasp and hold on to. We must live by faith. For us to enter heaven, for us to gain salvation, requires a complete reorientation of the way we live our lives. It's no good for me having an intellectual understanding of the teachings of the word and still living a selfish and worldly life. We must allow that will to be changed by the understanding. So this is how Swedenborg puts it. When people say that those are saved who have faith, they are saying something true. But in the word, nothing else is meant by faith than love to the Lord and charity towards the neighbour. And so a life that is derived from those loves. Matters of doctrine and established belief do not constitute faith, yet they are part of faith. For these, each and every one, exists to the end that a person may become such as they teach. That a person may become such as they teach. I went along to the World Day of Prayer on Friday and this was the passage they happened to quote, um, or the read from. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. 
But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The difference is in the doing, not the hearing. Look, I just want to reflect for a little while on the, the readings that uh, we read this morning. First of all, the harvest uh, reading from Exodus. There were three feasts. So we have the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is mentioned first, otherwise known as the Passover. So in other passages in, in the scriptures, it talks about it as being the Passover. And Swedenborg's understanding of this is this is purification from falsities. And if you remember the Passover and the unleavened bread, it's unleavened because it has no yeast in it. It's just the, the flour and the oil and the water mixed together and baked. Purification from falsities. Then there is the, the festival or the feast of first fruits, also known as the feast of weeks. And Swedenborg talks about this as representing the implantation of truth into good. And then we have the Feast of the Ingathering at the end of the year, also known as the Feast of Tabernacles. And this is the implanting of good. Now elsewhere, Swedenborg talks about another three-stage um, process to our regeneration, our spiritual growth, and that is repentance, reformation and regeneration. Repentance is the examining of the life so notice that first one, the examining of the life, the purification of falsities, the recognition that there is something about my life that is not right. The reformation is then to take on what is true from the word and to begin to apply it to life. And regeneration, the third step, is the, ref is the changing of the will to become, to, to actually desire to want the things the Lord wants for my life and for the life of others. So this has these three stages. And there's this interesting process that goes on in these festivals. There's a waving. It's not referred to in this passage, but uh, in one of the other biblical passages, there is this waving. The priest takes a sheaf of wheat in the first fruits, and in the end gathering, he takes a loaf of bread and he waves it. You know, so you imagine a priest grabbing this large sheaf of wheat and waving it. And it refers to the way that the Lord gives life to truth and the Lord gives life to the good in our, in our lives. Swedenborg again writes this, but knowing, understanding, acknowledging and believing belong to the understanding. Yet they do not have any being with the person until they become part of his will. And there is no manifestation of them with him until they become part of an understanding rooted in the will. For having being consists in willing and manifestation in acknowledging and believing as a result of willing. Things that have no such being or manifestation with a person are not properly his own. So there's real need for real change in our lives. And faith is part of that process, but it cannot be the end of it. It's only the beginning. I want to talk about Peter um, walking on the water to the Lord. So Peter has an interesting relationship with the Lord. He's regarded as the, really the primary apostle, the primary disciple. He seems to be um, so active in the gospel stories. There's that um, proclamation of the Lord that he makes and Jesus says to him, actually gives him the new name of Peter and Peter means rock because he says, on this rock I will build my church. And it's funny that a, a few verses later on, Peter makes a comment, uh, Jesus is talking about his, re his death his crucifixion, and Peter makes a comment, oh no, you know, that will never happen to you. And Jesus turns around to him and says, get behind me, Satan. So there's a very interesting relationship between these two men, Jesus and Peter. 
And, and we see something here of, of Peter's nature in this story of walking on the sea. You know, the Lord, they see the Lord coming across the sea towards the boat. And Peter's the one who says, you know, Lord, if it's you, call to me and I will come to you walking on the water. Now that in itself is an amazing act of faith. Peter had no reason to think that he would be able to walk on the water. And yet he makes that, you know, he says that to the Lord. He gets out of the boat and he begins walking on the water. But then notice what happens. He notices the wind and the waves around him. He becomes distracted by all of those things and he begins to sink. And he cries out to the Lord because he's sinking for the Lord to save him. Peter represents our faith. Peter is in that moment, it's the, the early stepping out in faith. It's the recognition there's something wrong with my life. I need to make a change. And so, you know, I bring the Lord into my life and I accept him as, you know, a, a reality in my life and I seek to follow him. I seek to walk in his ways. But then isn't it very easy for us to become distracted and realise that actually when I start looking at my life, there is all these terrible things that I do, that I, you know, motivations that I have that are less than perfect. And people get caught up in this idea that all you need to do is accept the Lord and you're saved. But this is the discovery that that's not the case. This is the discovery that there's something in my life that actually needs to change. And the only power that changes it is not my own, it is the Lord. And so Peter cries out to the Lord for assistance in that moment. I've seen many young Christians meet this point. You know, the church has often told them, as I said, you know, all you need to do is accept the Lord and you will be saved. It's not the end of the process. It's the beginning. And we must understand that. So the challenge for you, I think, for this week is really look at your life and say, ask yourself, do you live the faith you believe? We spent last year looking at the commands of Jesus and this is one of the reasons for it. Do you live the faith that you believe? Do you follow the Lord's commands in all that you do? Or are you pulled away by, by other forces? Now the reality is none of us do live that life. None of us live a perfect life. But don't panic. Do something about it. Ask the Lord to be your inspiration and your guide.